Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk on the lost art of database design. And uh, so how many people here are DBAs? Oh, one, one, two, two-ish. Okay, how many people are developers? Yay, developers. Okay, so we're going to talk to you about that. How many people have heard of Percona before? Oh, okay, about half. That's, that's pretty decent. So um, I am the head of open source strategy at Percona. You can find me at M. Yankovic. Um, we have a podcast called The Hoss. I'm the Hoss, head of open source strategy. Talks Foss, free and open source software. It rhymes. It's awesome branding. So um, you can drop me a mail if you want. Um, but uh, Percona is an open source database provider where we provide uh, services, software, tooling around MySQL, Postgres, and MongoDB. And so what I'm here to talk to you about is something that many of you may like, others may hate, but let's talk about databases. Databases, for a lot of folks, are uncool. Now, I don't know how you feel about this. I, I see you taking a deep breath like, oh, wait, this is wrong. But a lot of people think databases are boring, especially when you talk from a development perspective, because they're the necessary evil. When you talk to people who are designing new applications, the databases tend to get thought of last, right? Um, developers and managers, you know, executives, they often think code and the end product. They don't often think about the infrastructure side of things. Who cares about database design here? Does anybody really care about database design? Okay, a couple people. Well, I'm going to try and make the rest of you care. So, <laughs> um, so you know who knows that databases are uncool? This guy. That's right. He knows that databases are uncool. There are a lot of vendors out in the database space who know that it's uncool and are trying to convince you that they're not a database and that their product is cool, therefore. So you might hear a lot of marketing fluff around databases and database design, things like schemaless databases. Oh, you can use our ORM and you have to write zero code for the database. You can just use our API. You can just store a native JSON. Right? Um, the database is a service journey where it's just fully managed. You click a button and it just works. Um, all of these um, are trying to sell to that preference where developers want to think less about the database. They want to think more about their application. And so there's a lot of buzz around new terms and technologies that try and solve this uncool factor. Okay? Welcome, welcome. Uh, so. Database design is kind of like, open. oh yeah, evidently that it locks if you shut it. So, isn't that awesome? Okay. So, when we talk about database design topics, we often talk about how database design is like the plumbing for your house, right? So think about how, when, whenever you bought a new house, has any of you really spent a lot of time looking at the plumbing? Like other than like maybe, you know, you use the toilet or the sink or something, but do you really crawl under the crawl space or into the basement and look at the plumbing? Not many people do. And in fact, a lot of people who build their houses think of this as just this, you know, magic thing that happens underneath the hood. But it only works until it comes back and bites you. And then that's going to cause you significant issues. It's kind of like that house that has a great curb appeal, but when it has a bad foundation, it eventually can fall down. Right? And so we want to avoid that from happening. And so this is why we need to focus on database design that is, you know, optimal for your application. Because not only will you get a better foundation for your application, you're going to get better performance, use less space, have lower costs, have better security, you're going to have easier migrations and release cycles, and a better user experience. All these things are really important. So let's talk about some of those database design topics and the things that most people overlook and that we should really consider. Now I'm going to start with Captain Obvious here. If you have been designing applications and have databases at their core forever, then you probably already know some of these, so you might be like, oh, that's so obvious. But you would be surprised how many people miss these. This is something that happens over and over again, right? And so let's start with some of these obvious ones. 
okay? Schema and design, okay? Now, if you are using a relational database, if you are using a non-relational database, thinking about the data structures is incredibly important and it is the foundation for everything else. There are different databases that have pros and cons that you can work with. Um, each workload that you might deploy might benefit from one database over another, but it will also de benefit from the design in your schema. If you are running something that's aggregating a lot of data, having things or buckets or tables that can um, aggregate that data for you, pre-populated or running materialized views, things like that, that can really help um, there. If you have the right data types and the right schema, you're going to have more space efficiency. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. And then if you have the right indexes, you're going to have better performance. But when we talk about schema design, remember how I said that the marketing folks like to tell you schemas don't matter anymore, schema -less. I'm going to say that schema -less doesn't exist. Maybe some people out here in the audience are running schema -less databases. But here's the funny thing about schema -less databases, okay? It's really about unstructured data. And everybody likes unstructured data because they hate waiting for, you know, structures to change, right? So when you have to do a schema migration and you've got to wait forever for the table to alter or to move data around, it's a pain in the rear. So people look at the schema list side as a way to break themselves from it, right? But the flexibility that comes with schema list comes at a cost. And all of the vendors that you look at, like, for instance, MongoDB, they'll tell you that. They'll say, like, you shouldn't you know, have to worry about your schema, but you should validate your schema afterwards. And so whether you're paying the price to validate what's in your tables and in your structures in the database or outside of the database, you're still doing some validation. It's still a best practice. And so when we talk about, you know, this, when you don't have this and you just let it kind of grow, things slow down exponentially very, very quickly. Things get slow, they get a little over bloated, they cause all kinds of issues. And so you have to be careful when you start to look at these unstructured setups because there are downsides to them. And one of the big downsides I mentioned is space, and space is obviously the final frontier, um, you know, but it's also the first frontier for uh, performance, right? So when you think about a database design or a structure, a lot of it comes down to how much space is being consumed within the database. And it's not just your queries that are potentially slow, it's also things like backups or your replicas, you know, your dev test environments. Um, there can be a substantial increase um, in the overall size of your environment if you're not careful. Because space is cheap, but it is not free. And that's a very important thing to realize. Laziness does cost money in this case, and I have seen where we, we've seen like just from a cost perspective, even though disk is cheap, we're able to do some light t you know, schema uh, tuning and you know, have a massive decrease in the amount of costs per month, right? So when you look at an AWS environment and you get half off your bill just by optimizing your schema, that's a pretty significant savings. But unfortunately, we're all also data hoarders, right? So we are. Um, we love to hoard data. I don't think that anyone out here has ever heard from any sort of management, no, no, you can get rid of that data. I mean, if you have, you're one of the few. Because everybody wants data kept for longer, kept, you know, um, for an inf infinite amount of time, and kept more of it, right? You just want more and more and more. And so when you look at that mentality of storing everything, um, you really have to understand what that long-term impact is. Now, I'm going to give you an example that's out of the MySQL space, but... We work for a social media company, and they um, use your email as their driver for their entire website. So when you log in, you set up your email, they'll go ahead and they'll connect you with other people who are in your email box. They'll find you know, all kinds of things out about you. And every query, every access pattern um, for this particular social media company um, was using an email for their primary key. Now, in MySQL, there happens to be um, an interesting, you know, idiosyncrasy with using an email primary key. Primary keys in MySQL are stored in every subsequent secondary key. So the larger that field is, every other index you add also includes it. 
So in the case of something that is a bar char, let's say 200, you've got a very, very wide column. And even if you have another column that is, let's say, a true false that you're trying to index, it will include that email address as well. And so you can see massive, massive, you know, uh, amounts of wasted space. You also see this with a lot of ORMs where ORMs are using um, UUIDs, right? So if you're using a GUID uh, for your ORM as the primary key, it's generally a varchar 32, so a 32 character field. That's really large and that causes a similar issue. So in the case of the social media company, what we ended up doing was converting them to an auto increment. We used a unique key as the uh, email address. Then we also used a numeric hash because every time you have that primary key and you need to search for it, it's also in memory, right? So if we use a numeric hash for it, um, that's actually a smaller footprint in memory. So we could fit more in memory, we could fit more on disk, and we actually saved them like, uh, it was like $10 million a year on hosting. Um, it was ridiculous how much money and uh, performance they got back from that effort. And when you look at uh, you know, that example from MySQL, understanding you know how this looks you've got the varchar 32 at the top and let's just say you're storing the, f the string one two three four five six which is a numeric but people store that as a text more frequently than i would like to admit you you know storing a uh, hundred million data points is two uh, gigs worth of space whereas if you store that as an integer it's only 381. now you might say two gigs that's cheap but multiply this by you know, hundreds, if not thousands of columns in your database, and this really, really adds up. And so this is something you have to be very careful of. Uh, similarly, when you have, um, each database has their own data types that are specific for their environment, so you can have other data types that can benefit from this as well. So for instance, if you were going to use, let's say, a country name, um, you can store that as a bar chart and that will work, but as a varchar, that's a very large field. It's something that's going to take up a lot of space. There are ways that you could then, you know, maybe use a lookup table and have an integer lookup, and then you're going to store the integer, or you could use an enum field. And so this is where it's really important to understand that each database, whether it is MySQL or Postgres um, or Oracle or SQL Server, they're going to have special data types for you to use. And it is really, really important that you understand where you can use them. Um, for instance, like the INET um, you know, data type. That's specifically for IP addresses, because a lot of people, hey, they need to store IP addresses. But IP addresses aren't naturally a you know, thing. In Postgres, there's a UUID field, or an integer type, or a GUID uh, integer type. Again, all of these things are things that you can use to help reduce the cost of um, things. Do I hear a band? Wow, okay. I guess, uh, thank you for coming here instead of the party room. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, okay, so moving right along. So as we think about these different data types and how data is going to be accessed, you also have to think about the different access patterns that you have. And so each of the different access patterns that are out there, they may do similar things, but in the end, how you're accessing and manipulating data is critical to building out that schema and the design and figuring out where you need to add things. So that leads you to a discussion on, you know, indexing, right? So understanding that you shouldn't index everything, that's one of those, if anybody attended my 10 deadly talks, don't over index or under index, you have to get it just right. But um, you have to understand how your data is going to be accessed on a regular basis and optimize for that access pattern. Um, look for those common search patterns and make sure that you're adding indexes, um, you know, in, in a way that makes sense and realize it's going to change. So just because you release something today that's working doesn't mean tomorrow it won't. I mean, how often are people releasing nowadays? It seems like some people continuous deployments, right? You know, they're releasing every day. Other people, they're released still, you know, weekly, monthly, something like that. But every change that you do will make changes to your access pattern and you have to understand that. Now, I want to mention that, you know, probably one of the best advice that I can give when we talk about designing schemas, designing at databases, is not to be an idiot. So, Captain Obvious, right? Um, but keep things simple. And 
I have over-designed things, like just crazy over design. And I think that a lot of people overthink how they want to implement th something because they think that in the future it is possible that something is going to be used a little differently or they're think they're pre-thinking future use cases. Um, a good um, you know, I used uh, to work at this company, uh, while I was doing consulting for this company, who did um, voting. And so they were doing like a online voting, so when you would watch a presidential election, you would then vote on whether you liked the person or you didn't like the answer, and so they would track all this. And so they were having some significant issues. And the designer, the architect for this application, thought, I don't know what sort of demographics I might have about these people. So he decided to use a bit mask for all of his demographic information in a bar chart field. Okay, so the f you know you pull out this this really long string, okay, and if it's in the first character, it's you know a one is male, a zero is female. If it's in the second character, you know it's going to you know tell you um, whether they are Republican or Democrat, you know, and so it went on so so on so forth, and so he broke that up that way. Well, there are ways to create either columns or create you know different ways to get that level of flexibility. But by putting it in a bit mask, which is very uh, design uh, uh, development or application centric thought process, um, it actually caused more issues than you would think because that can't be effectively indexed. So picking out just the 54th character of this to see if it's a zero or a one, that's not an efficient pattern that the database can handle. So understanding what you can do um, in terms of handling uh, or, or passing down to the database and letting the database handle it is incredibly important. And so that's why, you know, you have to remember, okay, that database companies have been spending lots of money, lots of effort, that communities have been spending lots of time and effort to create these database features that are designed to solve these problems. And overthinking this and thinking that you can do a better job than a lot of what's out there already pre-built in the database is one of those things that makes me scratch my head. Now I see this often. In fact, uh, there was another company who had this awesome idea to make a social network for your music. So every time you listen to music, it would find other people listen to the same music and you know, back and forth. But they didn't trust that the database could join records and join two lists together. So they used the database to upload a list, uh, your playlist, and then they had a list already off to the side of all the music that was out there in the world, and then they loaded it into a Java app, and they looped through it. And then every time they found one, then they went out and they pulled out another table, and then they looped through that. And it was all done in Java. Now, this was a brilliant application. Um, I'm being sarcastic. But the brilliant application that this was would take a list of playlists every night, move them over, and then it would process them. Because of how they had built the infrastructure for this and because they decided to rewrite join, uh, to process a thousand playlists took seven days. So that means that if they have a thousand users, they're already seven days behind when the next day happens. Right? And so it just is a perpetual issue that continually causes is, you know, problems. So realize that there has been a lot of time, money, and effort by many people in the you know, database ecosystem to develop things like the right indexes, like the right data types, like joins, like encryption features. And so while you can write your own, the question is should you? And that is incredibly important to have that answered. And if the database doesn't have this feature that you really need, the question is, are you using the right database for what you're trying to do? There are a lot of different database choices out there, right? So you can use MySQL, you can use Postgres, you can use Mongo, you can use Oracle, you can use Cassandra, you can use, I mean, so many. And all of them have unique benefits and features. And so if there's something that you're trying to do that's better as a graph database, and you're trying to do it in a relational database, ask yourself why, right? So you know, don't force an application into something that doesn't fit and don't try and make these d 
design decisions to overcome those limitations if you can avoid it. So when we talk about that access pattern again, you know, there's a couple things that, you know, keep on coming up. All right, just in case thinking is very poor design. Okay, now I don't know if anybody has thought about this or has done this, but let's do the select for updates, right? So select for update locks your table, it locks the data because it thinks you're going to update it. But what happens when you don't update it? It stays locked until you release it. And so a lot of people actually are doing a select for update. This is actually one of the biggest issues we see from our managed service team is, oh, the database is locked. It's slow because people selected all this data for update and then never decided to do anything with it. That's a wasted cycle, okay? Now, I've also seen where people are selecting stars needlessly. This happens a lot with ORMs where ORMs want to return everything. So I was working with a big auction, online auction house uh, several years ago, and their ORM, which was Ruby on Rails at the time, um, you know, they had it select star for everything. And what was great was, not great, uh, they had this notification pop up that every time the price changed, they wanted to update like, you know, somebody and just pop up a little value. Well, the actual call back to the database selected the entire auction listing, returned it back to the system, threw everything away but the price, and then threw the price up. So they actually saturated the bandwidth between the application server and the database servers with all this wasted space. So just in case or just because design is really bad. And so understanding that, but also thinking about what's the common usage that's going to happen is important as well, right? So, you know, if you are going to be using this for certain features, there are ways to get data that is pre-aggregated. You can normalize some data. You can make sure that your access pattern is optimized for what you're returning. And you can also look at using external components, but realize that there are external components and events that happen that are going to impact your system and could change how your data access works. Okay, so for instance, if you work for a company that does accounting, during tax season, you're way busier than any other time of the year, right? And so that means you're going to have an event. If you work for a company that is really active during Super Bowl Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday sometimes has a huge event. Black Friday, right? Shopping season, single, days in, single day in China. These are days that events happen that anything that you plan for goes out the window really quickly. And so think first about those access patterns and make sure that you have designed for them. Now, before you decide to start coding, okay, realize that any decision you make before code is written into a terminal screen or a, you know, uh, editor, that is going to have the biggest impact on your system. So thinking up front, it's going to have a monumental impact on the performance, the scalability, the security of that system. Because after all, think of it like this, if a drive fails, you can pull the drive out and replace it. If you need a bigger instance, we all have the capability to upgrade to the next instance size. But if you designed a piece of crap application, you have to redesign the whole thing, right? It's not so easy to band-aid design decisions. So keep in mind that the schema side is important. Those access patterns are important. But there is more to think about, right? Thinking about beyond just the schema, beyond just the, you know, um, the, the code side of things, because it's all connected, right? What you choose to do, how you choose to interact and build your application, it's going to matter. And it starts with deciding and talking about the stack that you're going to use and understanding all the idiosyncrasies and all the interactions between different components, okay? You know, sometimes you don't have a choice. Sometimes you're forced into, you know, deciding on a stack. You're going to, you know, use, you know, this database, this, you know, uh, framework, this application. But what you are storing and how you build your application is going to matter. Now, let's use this example. I like to use this example as uh, a gaming app. So when you start to design in paper, right, you're like, okay, I'm going to build a new mobile app game on my phone or, you know, for the iPhone, I'm going to have some application servers, 
Maybe I'll have some cash later on, but you know, this is kind of the simplistic model that a lot of people think and they start with, when realistically it looks more like this, where there are lots of external services, there's lots of different databases, and there's lots of different components that are going to impact the performance and the overall scalability of a system. And um, how many people play like, you know, games, like game on their PC or Xbox? Yeah, yeah, fair number, okay. How many people have ever, you know, got the game like first week and there's nothing but problems, right? Yeah, and how many people love that experience? They live for that experience, okay? Um, the fun thing is, this is the number one issue that causes game problems, like game launch problems. So week one, when you launch a new game, um, what tends to happen is you have, you know, the database, this core, really worked out well. So this is, this is battle tested. This is 100%. You've gone through this process a thousand times. You have, you know, 10,000 beta testers who are on this, and it just works. But then you add in all this other stuff, right? So matchmaking. Oh, well, we forgot to benchmark that. We forgot to test that. Because that's, that's, that's this extra, you know, sm you know, service off to the side. Or the leaderboard, you know. Um, these are the things that cause most of those outages. It's crazy how it's a different process than most people think. And so when you talk about, like, from a, you know, database design perspective, you know, and you talk about the data that's in your core database, you also have to think about all these ancillary systems and how they're going to have to be used or accessed in order to get your application working. Now, as management changes, um, you're also going to start to see that there are different people who come in and will change that stack. So, um, <laughs> I don't know if anybody's experienced this. How many people have gotten a new boss and they come in and they go, we're going to switch cloud providers or we're going to switch, you know, oh, I hear laughs, or we're going to switch programming languages. Like, I'm a, I'm a node guy. No, I'm a go guy, you know, like, and like, so we're going to, and they, they, they do. They come in, they make those changes. And so you have to realize that even if you're setting this up right away correctly, things are going to evolve and change. And so you have to avoid some of those stack politics. But as those things change, realize that even the small things can matter. So I did a, a benchmark study on uh, different versions of Python and different MySQL client libraries, right? And so you'd think that Python versions, like who cares about Python versions? Um, but when you look at the difference between the number of users that were being able to be handled in MySQL um, for Python 3.10 versus 3.97, um, certain drivers saw a massive regression in overall, you know, uh, scalability. And one driver didn't. So if you just happen to be using the driver that is your unlucky driver, or you decided to, you know, set up a new system and it was using it and you were using 3.10, you would have a potentially pretty hefty penalty for that, right? And so small things matter, and so you have to realize that the interconnectivity of all of these different components could have an overall impact in the scalability of your systems. Now, we all try to put our trust in technology, but are we putting too much trust in technology? Because a lot of people um, aren't really thinking about the implications of what they're deploying, especially on the database side. So I've had several conversations this week at our booth where people come by and will be like, you know, oh, so what database do you use? Why well, use SQL? Oh, you use SQL Server? No, I use SQL. SQL Server? No. MySQL? No. PostgreSQL? No. SQL. And it's like, well, what do you mean? And it's like, well, I just click the button, it starts up. And it's like, but so you don't really understand what's underneath the hood. And, you know, we often put that trust into the de different technology components without understanding what happened when we deploy and use those technologies, right? And here's the fun thing. You can make anything work right if you have enough time and effort, right? Any database, any cloud provider, any libraries, any programming languages, you can make it do all kinds of crazy, unholy things. Doesn't necessarily mean that you should, right? And the success or failure is generally not predicated on our technology choices. 
It's how we design these systems and how we build them to use those components that's going to matter the most. And it's very um, you know, important to get that infrastructure right. And right now, that's even more true in the database space because there is a database out there for almost every workload, okay? So if you have, you know, the, you know, the need for analytics, if you have the need for time series, if you have the need for logging, there are specialized databases for each one of these. And if you use them for something that it's not intended for, it could work. But, you know, that's really sometimes more like, you know, putting the square peg in the round hole. It can work, but doesn't necessarily, you know, um, uh, work well. And so if you haven't taken care of that engine and you haven't set that up correctly, then that awesome car that you built, because you might have this great application framework, you might have this great UI, you might have this great idea, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to perform well. And because you're putting a really tiny motor in a sports car, it's just not going to work. So trust but verify when we talk about those technology stacks, right? Make sure that you are understanding the components and really understand who's responsible for that type of work because who manages the infrastructure and who is building the applications and who's interacting, you know, that is incredibly um, overlooked, right? So who's responsible for those types of components? Now, this is not necessarily a design decision, but understanding how the systems work together, just like that big picture that I drew of all the different components, that's going to be your key to success. And so, you know, we, we say like, oh, well, what about the cloud? Because, you know, again, there's these people who are out there saying, hey, we know databases are uncool, so shouldn't you just deploy in the, you know, the cloud? And then it's just all magic. Well, when we talk about that, you have to understand that there's a shared responsibility um, uh, model for all cloud providers, which is a nice way of saying it's on you except for certain components that we agree are on us. And there is a fine line. So you are responsible for that architecture design of your systems, okay? You are ultimately the person in charge of that. You are in charge of configuring and tuning. You're in charge of the optimization. The cloud providers make sure that your hardware's there that the systems are provisioned, but all of the hard work, all of that design work, that's on you. Now, how many people are running their databases in their cloud native deployments yet? Anybody doing Kubernetes databases only? No, just one, two, okay. So, you know, everybody's running cloud native, right? And so everybody's doing microservices. And the fun thing is every microservice wants its own database. So that means that you know, if you used to have one monolithic database, now you have 10,000 monolithic databases because they're all forgotten into the ether. Uh, but each of the databases that you might deploy are going to have a different level of scalability and usability if you're deploying via Kubernetes um, and you're trying to deploy in a cloud native environment. So, you know, MySQL and Postgres, they're great at certain things, but they're not necessarily great at you know, that, ex you know, uh, scaling and that sharding or that capability to extend and expand. But MySQL and Postgres are very battle tested and they're used, um, you know, for a lot of uh, applications where the data uh, reliability is absolutely a requirement. So keep in mind, if you're going to be deploying cloud native databases, there's some uh, things to consider. Now, how many people have heard the term new SQL? Oh, okay. One, two. So, um, you know, New SQL is, you know, the idea that you can scale your databases automatically and it will automatically handle everything behind the scenes. So remember I talked about space, right? Um, so typically the more you store in a database, the slower things get, okay? The more memory that's going to be used, the more disk that's going to be consumed, the more CPU cycles you're going to use. So bigger databases equal slower databases. So when we talk about new SQL, what they're really looking at doing is taking the concept of sharding, okay, um, which is taking your data set and breaking it into smaller data sets and distributing it throughout different database uh, servers and different quote unquote shards. 
and then presenting that as one unified database. And so they're trying to do this automatically, but sharding's been around for, gosh, you know, 20 years, 30 years. I mean, sharding's a concept that's been around since I've been doing stuff. Anybody sharding their data? Okay. As you get bigger, it's uh, something that's uh, often looked at. Um, but you've got a couple different uh, new SQL you know, players out there, TidyB, Cockroach, Yugabyte. Um, they ha offer great extendability um, you know, because they're handling everything behind the scenes um, and trying to mask the complexity from you. But there are blind spots when it comes to application workload, just like any of the other databases and any of the other designs. You can see that these, um, if you write things the wrong way or you're using it for the wrong use case, it can definitely slow down. And then there are other uh, technologies like VTES or CITUS, if you're using Postgres or MySQL, that are designed specifically to be a framework on top of your database that does sharding over what your common database technologies are. So if anybody's heard of PlanetScale, they do VTES. Microsoft owns CITUS now, so um, big companies behind these. But as your data gets larger, you're going to have to look at how you handle that and so these are effective ways or tools that are already out there. So finally, I want to leave you with this. Um, don't over-engineer things. The number one issue that I hear over and over again um, from people who come to us for help in the performance space is that we are over-engineering systems and that is causing the slowdowns. We're overthinking the complexities that need to be there. And that's my presentation for today. Questions. Happy to take questions. You're looking or you're thinking of questions, but you don't have any. That's okay. That's okay. We don't have to take questions. All right. Oh, question. Oh, okay. So the question is, because I'm supposed to repeat, it says right here, uh, is there any sort of criteria for deciding on which is the right database to use? Number one, um, what's the skill set of your developers and what are they already comfortable with? Okay, so introducing a new technology to developers who are already like either fans of Postgres, Maria, or MySQL and trying to get them to learn something brand new generally has disastrous consequences because you just don't get the buy-in and there's all kinds of weird things that happen. In fact, uh, we worked for a large Fortune 500 company and they're like, thou shalt move off of Oracle to MySQL. And you know what all the Oracle uh, developers did? They go, no. <laughs> and uh, the management said, well, we're going to make all of the other managers bonuses directly related to how much they move off. And you know what happened? They got no bonuses, right? Because it was something that they couldn't win the hearts and minds of those who had to do it. Now, when you look at um, other features, you know, MySQL and Postgres have very similar features, okay? So they are both good at similar workloads. There are a few things that one can do over the other. Um, Maria is going to follow very closely with uh, MySQL, although it does have some add-ons and some bolt-ons if you're willing to pay or use you know, some of their uh, extended licenses. So you can kind of categorize those as the relational. And so that's more of, if you have a need for the relational, I go with what is the most comfortable for the customer client. And then if there's a specialized need, for instance, if they need to use, you know, Microsoft's, you know, cloud instances and they need sharding, well then Citus is probably a better choice and then that's only available in Azure. Um, if they're going to use MySQL and they need to use, you know, uh, something else, then I might go with PlanetScale for that or VTES. So I'll, I'll deploy there. Um, but then when you look at like document DBs or graph databases, those are very specific to what you're trying to store and how you're trying to access it. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so the question was, is there any tools that we can use to look at the efficiency of your design? So there's a few, actually. So if you're using Postgres, for instance, um, there are, um, you know, index statistics uh, views that you can use to look at what indexes are being used and which ones aren't and how often they're being used um, in MySQL. Um, there are similar uh, indexes. Uh, there are tools, so Percona, for instance, has Percona Toolkit, which runs on MySQL that can look for 
inefficiencies around that as well. Um, how many people? How many people use Postgres here? Okay, MySQL. Okay, so mostly Postgres. Okay, so um, you know you might be familiar with like PG statements uh, to collect statement information on the queries and looking at query access patterns. Uh, that is helpful. We just released PG Stat Monitor, um, which extends that even further and it allows you to store in bucket, you know, time slices. Uh, so those are tools that can really help identify things. Uh, we also built a tool that's for query analytics that's out there in the open source space called uh, PMM, so Percona Monitoring Management. And it's got a query analytics function in it, um, so it can help find, you know, slow queries and what might be missing in index as well. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of variety of tools. Um, when it comes to actual schema design and choosing the right data type, that's a little less, you know, that's, that's more in the iffy space for most. Okay, awesome. Go. Oh. Ah. ah, agnostic design, yes, yes. So th this, is, this is where it, there's, there's the trade-offs, right? So there are specific, you know, features of each database and if you're worried about that level of lock-in it's it's a bit trickier right because oh um, so okay so agnostic design is where you want it to work on almost any database so you could have more portability right so you can migrate from one you know to the next um, and so you know for instance in Postgres there's Babelfish now that will help convert SQL Server to, you know, Postgres. But what's funny is a lot of the tools that are out there to do those types of things, they're kind of one-way migrations, right? So they want to get you in and then keep you in. It's the Hotel California model. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 you can check in, but you can't leave. Uh, so I think that it's a little more difficult to take that agnostic approach. <sighs> are you trying to do that also for like cloud providers and other things? Yeah, so it, it's hard because you, you have to lock into a technology or two, and then once you start to get into the high availability structures and the backup structures, they differ so much between how you would back up, you know, let's say MySQL or Postgres or SQL Server, that you, you end up getting some lock-in even if you don't want to. And that's where I think the better choice is to look at choosing an open source tool that doesn't require a vendor underneath. So Postgres is a great example, right? You can get support and services for Postgres from pretty much anybody, right? You want to use it in any of the clouds, you can have portability between clouds. Um, you want to use it on your own, you can use it on your own. You want to get commercial support, uh, the EDB folks were here, um, uh, scale grid, um, uh, you know, so all, all kinds of other stuff. Okay? Cool.